Hello, today our guest is His Excellency Dr. Jose Ramos Horta, the new elected president of Timor Leste. The Nobel laureate was inaugurated as the fifth president on the 20th of May 2022 when Timor Leste celebrated its 20th independence anniversary. Dr. Ramos Horta previously served as the second president from 2007 to 2012 and Minister of Foreign Affairs. He was also Prime Minister and he held key positions in the United Nations in areas of mediation and peace operations. It is my honor to present the one and only Dr. Jose Ramos Horta. How are you, Mr. President? Uh, thank you. I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you for uh, okay. having me in your show. Thank you for joining me in this discussion. Once again, congratulations on your victory and my best wishes for your success. Okay, Excellency, um, you are also an independence figure in Timor-Leste and of course uh, Nobel laureate. You've been fighting for the rights of the people. In fact, the money you received from the Nobel Prize you donated to a program called Michael Credit for the Poor. To get to where you are now, I'm sure there are people who have influenced you throughout the journey. So could you share with us who they are and who did help you find your authentic voice? Uh, thank you. Uh, of course, uh, in the beginning of our uh, struggle for uh, self-determination and independence, there were two uh, figures, two personalities that were decisive, the most important. One was Mr. Xavier Amaral, the other is Nicolau Lobato. That was in the beginning, 74, 75. Then uh, as the conflict uh, progressed, and uh, Nicolau Lobato uh, died uh, in combat. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Mr. Xavier Amaral uh, uh, was uh, dismissed as president by threatening itself. There was internal problems. Xavier Amaral was uh, imprisoned by threatening in the mountains for some years. And then he was rescued by Indonesia. Then during a period there was uh, no clear leadership in the country. In 1981, someone emerged, and that was Shanana Guzman, Mr. Shanana. He is the one who reorganized the resistance from almost total collapse, reorganized Fretilin, reorganized Falintil, mobilized the people again with extraordinary vision and uh, courage, audacity. And then uh, he began to lead the struggle even stronger than before. So for me, uh, these three personalities were very distinct in the history of the country. Of course, Mr. Xavier Maral was very short period 75 to 77, Nicolau Lovato 75 to 78 when he was killed. Uh, Shanana led the struggle for 17 years inside the country, in the mountains, eight years in prison in Sipinang, yes. which he considered what to be a university uh, and a, a place where he learned to love Indonesian people. And uh, in prison, he made many friends. And uh, he knew many people. He knew some other Timorese who were in prison with him. Uh, he knew some Indonesians who were in prison because of Timor Leste, like uh, Budiman. Yes. And, uh, but he also knew a very interesting character in Indonesia, uh, a banker, a famous banker from Mapindu. Eddie Tansil, 
Eddie right. Townsend, Eddie Townsend was in the same prison like Shanana, and Eddie Townsend and Shanana became friends. <laughs> Shanana told me, but then one day, Eddie Townsend disappeared, <laughs> and uh, so uh, Mr. Shanana, uh, extraordinary personality. He has zero anger, hatred towards Indonesia. And uh, he actually uh, has a love for Indonesia, Indonesian people. He taught Timorese to respect to, about to Indonesia. So these two, these uh, three personalities, Xavier Maral, I became of the political leaders in Timor-Leste. I was the one who closed us on a personal basis to Xavier Amaral and Nicola Lovato. I knew Nicola Lovato when we were teenagers, actually yes. before teenagers. And uh, Xavier Amaral, I was the one who spent most time with him after 99, 2000. And uh, then came Shanana Guzman, and I have worked with him uh, from day one, from uh, 95, 96, I began to work with Miss Shanana Guzman until today. Right. Okay. Dr. Ramasorta, you experienced unpleasant situation and some were dangerous too in the past. Uh, you were forced into exile. You lost your four siblings during military operation and you were the target of an assassination attempt in your first term of presidency. But you still be kind by forgiving the people involved. You even rejected a demand for an international tribunal to bring human justice, uh, sorry, a human rights violator to justice. My question is that, what made you do that? And how did you take it all in and continue to journey? Well, uh, of course, you ask many questions there of different uh, situations, but they all related, uh, similar. And uh, A, let's say in relation to Indonesia and uh, the invasion of Indo Timor Leste by Indonesia took, took place in 1975. A year that was of uh, tremendous upheavals in Southeast Asia. When the uh, United States, the, uh, the, it lost the first war that the Americans lost after World War II. The United States emerged absolutely victorious at the end of World War II, defeated Japan, defeated Nazi Germany. Of course, it didn't defeat alone, and uh, it reconstructed Europe. So it was the absolute dominant power in the world. Then it entered the Korea War that was inconclusive. Uh, North Korea and China were not able to conquer South Korea. They had the uh, armistice and the, uh, the ceasefire and the division of North and South Korea. And then soon after, the French went to the war in Vietnam. Of course, the French were thoroughly defeated by the North, by Viet Cong. And the Americans decided to step in the war. Huge, huge uh, American uh, involvement in the Vietnam War. At one point, there were 500,000 American troops in Vietnam. There were the massive bombings of Vietnam, of Cambodia. More bombs fall, fell on Cambodia than uh, in the entire European continent during World War II. So, and then in 75, the Americans were forced to withdraw from Vietnam. There was the fear of a communist advances into the South. Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, everybody were afraid of the domino theory. It was this time that uh, Indonesia invaded Timor-Leste. Partly consequence of the Cold War, partly uh, consequence of the Vietnam War, American defeat. And uh, so we became a casualty of Vietnam. 
a casualty of Cold War. Indonesia became a casualty of Cold War. Indonesians made a mistake. You know, uh, in history, many of people in the third world, whether in Asia, Africa, Latin America, or even Europe, made the tragic historical mistakes of joining, either joining America or joining the Russians, the Soviet, or China. Indonesia had the third largest communist party in the world, PKI, that was pro-China. Uh, and uh, of course, in the midst of all the situation, it completely uh, uh, shook Indonesia, Indonesian society. So the mentality of the Indonesian military was uh, of fear of obsession against the communists. That's when you had the 65, 66 war, the you know, a coup following by the problems. Then uh, the Portuguese colonial empire collapsed. Fratlin took over in Timor-Leste. Yes, Fratlin was left-wing. And, uh, uh, and uh, there were many strong Marxist-Leninist elements in Fratlin. And Indonesia was afraid of that. So we had the invasion. I only say, uh, looking back, first tragic mistake of Indonesian uh, communists to uh, have uh, the illusion about a proletariat paradise and a uh, you know, communist paradise that never existed and will never exist. And uh, made a mistake in joining the, this rivalry between uh, China and the Soviet Union and between the communist bloc and the United States. So Indonesian people paid a heavy price and we paid a heavy price. Yeah. And uh, so because of that, we said Suharto is gone. Indonesians also suffer, casualty of the Cold War. Indonesians also died in Timor-Leste. They made a fatal mistake because influenced, shaped by the mentality of the post-World War II, particularly Cold War and Vietnam. So let's uh, try to reach back to Indonesia as friends, as neighbors. And that was Mr. Shanana's philosophy and my own philosophy. And it was great that the Indonesian people, Indonesian society, uh, who had nothing to do with the Suharto invasion of Timor-Leste, <laughs> and they had no real connection with Timor-Leste. Timor-Leste is not uh, Moluccas, is not Aceh, is not Sumatra, you know. So uh, Indonesians literally didn't care much because there was no connection, intimate, for centuries. So Indonesians, political leaders and people accepted. And uh, after the referendum, Indonesia always tried to help Timor-Leste. And we immediately developed a very good relationship. And many people in Asia, in the world, in the Middle East, in Europe, in the United States, every time I spoke about Timor-Leste, post-independence and our relationship with Indonesia, they are very impressed how the two countries, after 24 years of conflict, became so friendly with each other, unlike Palestinians, Israelis, unlike Kosovo and Serbia, and uh, so many other conflicts in the world that people not able to overcome conflict and live together. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. President, in your recent state address, you mentioned that Timor-Leste would build a closer uh, relations with Indonesia, especially concerning uh, East Nusa Tenggara, the closer province from Timor-Leste. What are the specific areas of cooperation or programs that you are planning to develop in East Nusa Tenggara? I think uh, because Timor-Leste is small, 1.3 million people, uh, we have uh, to look at an integrated economy whereby 
Timor-Leste and Nusa Tenggara Timur and other Eastern Indonesia territories, provinces, uh, work together to complement our respective economies. So East Timor and Nusa Tenggara Timur, Indonesia province of NTT, uh, must look at how we do things together. We do agriculture together. So the whole island of Timor become a big agriculture uh, producer. So the whole island becomes self-sufficient that we produce everything that we consume, East and West Timor. Of course, some things we produce in East Timor, other things produce in West Timor. Things that produce in West Timor, we buy from West Timor. <laughs> things that we produce in East Timor and West Timor doesn't have, we sell to West Timor. Because uh, uh, Indonesia is too big and uh, 270 million, uh, 13, 13, uh, 17,000 islands of which 3,000 are inhabited. There are parts of Indonesia that is very developed, you know, very industrialized already, sophisticated, while East Timor and NTT and others are still in very uh, low level of uh, development. So we have more in common mm -hmm. with them. Hopefully, 10, 20 years from now, uh, East Timor and the other province of Indonesia reach the same level like Bali or like uh, Java. But in the meantime, for the benefit of our common peoples, West Timor and others in the region, and uh, East Timor, we develop agriculture, increase food production, vegetables, fruits, fisheries, small, lab, small scale industries mm -hmm. that uh, we sell to each other, or we can, yes, export to Northern Territory of Australia, uh, where the market is small because our production is small. Even between East Timor and the West Timor, we, uh, if you look at the total volume of uh, anything we produce, will never be sufficient to satisfy any big market. So we target Northern Territory of Australia, maybe Western Australia, we target Singapore, maybe we target uh, Korea. Um, in certain areas. We must improve, uh, look together at water management because East Timor and West Timor and other islands of Indonesia have very little water. We have to be very careful with it. Very dry uh, in uh, the Eastern Indonesia. And uh, even Bali, I know from reading, uh, Bali, when you look at it, look very green, but it's becoming to be water stress because too much development, too many people, too many golf uh, resorts, uh, right. too many hotels, too much digging for underground water, and the water levels in Bali becoming scarce. It's called water stress. And today, even worse, East Timor is even worse than Bali because we have less water than the, the whole province of NDT, the East Timor. So we have to be very careful to do joint management of water resources. Of course, to do that, we need the blessing of central government in Jakarta. We need the know-how of uh, people in Indonesia we can get the support from other countries like Australia or Japan uh, in terms of uh, helping with agriculture and uh, water management. Fisheries, we have to be very careful about not overfishing. Right. You look at uh, the regions you know, of uh, Thailand, Philippines, uh, all these countries overfish for many, many decades. Right. Why, why fishing fleets come all the way to Timor Sea? Why fishing fleets go all the way to the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa? Well, because consume too much fish, no uh, prudent management of uh, fish stock, and uh, uh, we have a 
much, much less fish stock in the world, 70% destroyed. So one day, if you're not careful, Indonesia, mm -hmm. Indonesian people who live from the fish no longer have much fish to, for themselves. So these are all the areas that I think we have to work together. And uh, Timor-Leste and NTT, Indonesia, have to work face to face, not back to back. Of course, we are not working back to back. You know, previous governments, Indonesia have done a lot in their relationship, but we have to do much more. I want to see more cultural activities, sports activities, people's exchange, student exchange, between East and West Timor, between East Timor and Bali or Java or whatever. Okay, that's great. And also, Mr. President, Indonesia and Timor-Leste have agreed on resolving border issues on land. I'm talking about Noel Besi, Citrana, and Okuse Ambeno, and Bijayal Sunan Oben. That's, that's okay. Now, uh, but how about the progress or plan or perhaps your directive on resolving maritime borders between the two countries. Uh, Mr. Shanana Usman is the authority in Timor-Leste in dealing with uh, land boundary and maritime boundary issues. He has concluded with enormous success maritime boundary negotiations with Australia that is settled we, uh, he has conducted a negotiation with Indonesia on our common land boundary. Negotiations proceeded very well, almost concluded, but then came COVID and uh, the situation got uh, stuck. Uh, but on the land border, uh, there is almost an agreement. I think there's only lacking some details uh, I'm told by Mr. Shanana that uh, he intends to travel to Indonesia soon and to restart the dialogue so that we resolve the uh, border, land border demarcation. On the maritime border between Indonesia and Timor-Leste will take more time probably. Indonesia and Timor-Leste agree that only when we resolve the land border, we move to the maritime border. Because Indonesia has a lot of, uh, you know, issues on its agenda, yeah, maritime boundaries and uh, with other countries, uh, and uh, so it it might take longer to resolve the maritime boundary, but it should happen. I hope in the next five years that we also okay. conclude maritime boundary negotiations and reach agreement with Indonesia in the next five years. Okay. Okay, awesome. Excellency, moving on to another topic. Uh, Timor-Leste is adamant to join the ASEAN. Previously, you said that joining ASEAN will open ample opportunities for Timor-Leste, such as attracting foreign direct investments. So what's your expectation? Is it going to be next year during Indonesia's chairmanship? It will be uh, highly symbolic and fair that Timor-Leste joined during Indonesian presidency. It is our closest neighbor. We share land border, maritime border. We have years, decades of uh, joint experience, uh, many, many commonalities. For the past 20 years, Timor-Leste has been a loyal neighbor of Indonesia a loyal neighbor of ASEAN countries. I give an example. Since I became foreign minister in 2002, the instructions I gave to all the staff in the foreign ministry was the following. On any regional or international issue, we follow ASEAN leadership. We don't do anything different from ASEAN countries. If and when ASEAN countries don't reach agreement on some issue, like uh, South China Sea right. or Myanmar, we follow Indonesia's leadership. So when ASEAN themselves don't agree, well, 
solution is we go along with Indonesia. Why? Two reasons. Our closest neighbor, Indonesia, even during the Suharto era, we can disagree with Suharto and we disagree on almost every, everything with Suharto, but even going back to Suharto era, Indonesian diplomacy was always very prudent, always very well prepared, well studied. Indonesian diplomats were super active in every international forum. There was no nice. multilateral body where Indonesians are not there. And I watched the way they operate over the years. Uh, they never make any uh, mistake. They don't improvise. And that's mm -hmm. because one of my uh, hobbies uh, is to study, is to observe. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I follow few diplomacies in the world. I look at the British diplomacy, one of the best, yeah. the Vatican, top class, the Portuguese also outstanding, Brazil mm -hmm. is very good, Algeria, absolutely very competent, Cuba, very competent, and uh, Russia, uh, not really, uh, China has to learn a bit more uh, mm -hmm. about soft power diplomacy, and uh, Singapore, outstanding, and, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, Indonesia, my view, is one of the very best in the world. So I said, safer for us, uh, because Indonesia is our neighbor, uh, have a very prudent, wise diplomacy. We follow. So all these years, we never uh, follow or vote differently from ASEAN or Indonesia. That's one example of our, our seriousness in joining ASEAN. We don't want to be different, or we don't want to be a nuisance. We don't right. want to be uh, unpredictable. No. We have to be predictable. No one has to guess where we stand, what we are going to do. Uh, so, uh, and we are Southeast Asia. We, are, we don't belong to Northeast Asia. We are Southeast Asia. We are mm -hmm. not South Asia. Oh. And uh, if Indonesia is in Southeast Asia, if NTT is Southeast Asia, if Papua is part of Southeast Asia, because part of Indonesia, well, East Timor is. By geography, we are part of it. And, uh, and I understand if there were countries in the past that were skeptical about Timor joining ASEAN, within ASEAN. That's absolutely natural. And maybe they were right at the time that we shouldn't join because we are not really prepared. It, it took us 10 years of preparation, of improving the function of our administration, the functionality of all of our state right. administration, and improving our own diplomacy, embassies, services, improving our economy. And uh, so we have been following the benchmarks, the three pillars of ASEAN. We have uh, fulfilled all the expectations, except in the economy. In economy is still we are lagging in many ways. So we are ready uh, to join in 2023 under Indonesia leadership. Okay, all right. Still on ASEAN uh, issue, Mr. President, the recent U.S. ASEAN Special Summit in Washington agreed to establish an ASEAN-U.S. Comprehensive Strategic Partnership in November. And they also uh, wanted to ensure freedom of navigation in the South China Sea and also, uh, of course, strengthen cooperation in the digital economy, among others. So what is your view on the U.S.-ASEAN cooperation in particular and the U.S.-Indo-Pacific strategy in general? As long as any regional or international initiative aims to foster greater understanding among nations, greater cooperation in the economic field, social field, to improve the lives of uh, hundreds of millions of people, 
to preserve the environment, to rescue our oceans, uh, to save our oceans. If uh, these initiatives uh, aim for uh, lessening uh, big powers rivalry and the tensions, I think they are very good. But mm -hmm. if the US uh, with India uh, aim at uh, countering China or contain China, I don't agree. Mm -hmm. I, as a president of this country, as an individual, I don't agree. Because there were attempts before in the 60s to contain China. Okay. Never succeeded. Remember what China was in the 60s, what China is today. The mm -hmm. whole containment strategy against China completely failed to the point that today, back in the 60s, China was an agrarian economy, rural economy of poor peasants. Today it is the second biggest economy of the world, dominating artificial intelligence, digitalization. And it is uh, one of the, it is the biggest supplier of uh, anything you can think of. You go to Rome, to the Vatican City, you want to buy Catholic uh, souvenirs. They have everything. You look at the back, it says made in China. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, maybe even if uh, you go to some Muslim shop souvenirs, and uh, maybe you look in the back, it was not made in Saudi Arabia, it's made yeah. in China. <laughs> so uh, I would say better the U.S. used its power, its knowledge, its know-how yeah, to overtake China again in science, in technology, in outer space uh, uh, explorations, rather than trying to stop the other one. No, you try to beat, beat them through your knowledge, through your investment. Try to beat them through competition. Don't look at China as an enemy because China, I know China, I've been there many, many times. I met President Xi Jinping and the other Chinese leaders over the years. No, their focus is to have a peaceful, prosperous Asia. Their focus is to have a bigger connection between Asia and Europe, Africa and North America and Latin America. But China knows for China to remain prosperous, and deliver to their own people, more than 1 billion people, they need a very peaceful Asia, a peaceful world. And that's, they know that. So they, have, they are extremely careful with Taiwan. Uh, they have not done any action to, uh, uh, well, they intimidate, they do exercise, all of that, mm -hmm. but no aggressive, uh, in, I don't think, uh, we can fear a Chinese uh, use of force on Taiwan. And the uh, Ukraine situation, maybe even a lesson to anyone in China that might think of using force to settle Taiwan problem. But Taiwan also, and Americans have to be careful, don't provoke China. Don't provoke again and again. Don't uh, insult them. And... Uh, for centuries, Europeans, everyone invaded China. China was invaded many times by the West. Mm -hmm. They never invaded the West. And uh, so I would advise that try to outdo China through your knowledge, through your uh, intelligence, your technology, uh, science, and so on, through commerce and uh, uh, make more friends in Timor-Leste or in Africa, in Asia, by investing more seriously. The, and that I mean Australia, United States, Europe. And they mm -hmm. cut short your bureaucracy. Sometimes with the West, we ask something. There are so many conditions. Mm -hmm. And then uh, take long time to deliver. The Chinese, they don't ask too many questions. And... Uh, the leaders of the country present a plan and uh, they try to respond, they try to help. 
Of course, we are not stupid, we are not naive. We, ha you, we have to study the conditions, you know, the paper, that, uh, the agreement with China, yeah. But, uh, so that's the difference. Uh, and that's why China is winning uh, in Africa, in Pacific Islands. Okay. Um, now I want to talk about uh, G20 and want to get some views from you. Indonesia is chairing the G20 this year. And Dr. Ramasarta, you are one of the few senior leaders in this region. So do you have any expectation from uh, Indonesia's G20 presidency to bring the voices of developing countries? And just recently, uh, uh, we all know that uh, President Joko Widodo has uh, sent an invitation to the Ukrainian President Zelensky to uh, come to the G20 summit. Of course, uh, President Putin, uh, Joko, Joko Widodo also uh, sent the invitations because Russia is part of G20. So perhaps, uh, what is your expectation on the meeting in November? I completely agree with Indonesia's position in inviting uh, the two leaders, uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. I think that's the way, uh, the correct way for Indonesia to do. On uh, Indonesia chairmanship of G20, uh, not only as a Timorese leader, but uh, I'm involved with the, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate from India, Kailash Satyarthi, uh, who is the founder of uh, a big movement in India and in the world for protection of children, particularly child labor and child slavery in South Asia and in the rest of the world. He and I, a few months ago, we already wrote to President Jokoyu, pleading with President Jokoyu, please put the issue of child labor, child slavery, mm -hmm. child poverty on the agenda of G20. Because as consequence of COVID and the, the global recession, hundreds of millions of people in the developing world went back to poverty. And tens of millions of children got to extreme poverty. And uh, many, many tens of millions of children became a, uh, a child labor, entered the child labor. So I appeal to President Jokoyo to put on the agenda of G20, the issue of uh, child protection, child labor, child slavery. Second, as I would hope that President Jokoi would do in the leading of the G20 is to have uh, the debt, the debt of fragile states, mm -hmm. the debt of LDCs, least developed countries, and other developing countries, their debt completely written off because in the midst of this pandemic that is continuing, we mm -hmm. continue lockdown in many countries like China, in Shanghai and Beijing, with the deterioration of living conditions of people, hundreds of millions went back to poverty. The banks must do their part, write off the debt of all these countries, fragile countries, LDCs and other indebted countries. That's the only way to give a chance to these countries to restart their economy. Look at the catastrophic situation in Sri Lanka. Well, everybody blaming China, but actually the largest portion of the debt of Sri Lanka is not to China. The uh, Sri Lanka debt to China is only 12% of the total debt. Majority of the debt is to Western commercial banks, uh, the World Bank and IMF and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way uh, for uh, developing countries and the rest of the world to have a chance to recover faster. Right. So that would be my, uh, my appeal. Of course, on a bilateral basis, I... I'm hoping to visit Indonesia. We, I got invitation from President Jokoyu already to visit. 
Mm -hmm. our diplomat through diplomatic channels Timorese and Indonesia we are looking at the time when I will go to Indonesia and uh, as tradition already for the last 20 years the president of Timor-Leste upon election and the prime minister upon election the first country mm -hmm. we visit is Indonesia so I, we, I expect to visit in uh, June and in, in uh, July with okay. government this year this year mr president this this year this year yeah mm -hmm. with government uh Timorese government ministers maybe with private sector people to discuss implementation of agreements that we already have with indonesia and explore new new ways of uh, the two countries Timorese and indonesia expand their relationship okay awesome hopefully I could meet you again in Jakarta when you're visiting Indonesia. Um, yes, uh, Mr. President, to close this discussion, perhaps you have a message that you would like to convey to the people of Indonesia and Timor-Leste and especially the youth of both nations. Yeah. Before that, uh, mm -hmm. you are compass, no? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, uh, the first time I went to Indonesia in 1974, I met uh, three, four Indonesian journalists. One was George Adijondru. Yes. Tempu magazine. Tempu started only a few years before when I went there. I met the uh, Saban Siajian, Sinar Harapan yes. at the time. Yes. I met Hari Kawilarang, uh, Sinar. Okay, Harapan. I know them all. Yeah, the late Hari Kawilarang. Yeah, they passed away already. Uh, and mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and Agus Parengkuan, Kompas. Yes, see there, the late Agus Parengkuan, former ambassador also. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. Agus Parengkuan was very good friend of mine. Uh, oh, so I know okay. uh, way back to '74. Right. Agus Barenko, he came to Timor Leste first time in 1973, and I met him here in the '74. Right. And over the years, we became very good friends. And uh, I know Compass since '74. Uh, right. My message to uh, to Indonesia is one of uh, friendship, as we all know. Timorese people, government to government, G to G, people to people, exceptionally good relation. Indonesian people have shown to the Timorese people Indonesian uh, uh, maturity, Indonesian uh, heart, because when we separated, Indonesia could have said, you didn't want to stay with us, you want to be free, independent, to say good luck and they would turn it back. No, but Indonesian leaders, beginning with Guzdur, with first with uh, BJ Habibi, with Guzdur, Ibu Mega, SBE, and now Jokoyu have been absolute uh, men of state, of uh, statemanship and story, and in region society. And we have this very unique relationship in Asia. Timorese travel to Indonesia, no need for pest, for visa. Indonesians in Timor, no need for a, a visa on arrival. And they get visa on arrival. We have a very active movement of Timorese, thousands crossing the border uh, legally. If you look at the data of how many Timorese enter Indonesia each month, you would be surprised. Mm -hmm. According to Indonesian own official data, Timor-Leste is the number four country in the world of visitors to Indonesia. Number four. And uh, uh, so, and we have a thousand Timor students in Indonesia. Right. So it's a very uh, relation of real proximity. We should try to translate that into more economic, trade, tourist, cooperation for the benefit of our two countries, but particularly for the benefit of Timor Leste, because we are still uh, in a much, much worse shape than Indonesia, obviously. And that's why I emphasize for the next five years, 
expand their relationship with Indonesia as a whole, and mm. in particular with the neighboring uh, islands. All right, Mr. President, I am honored to have the opportunity to speak with you and thank you for your valuable views. You are among the few leaders of this region who have been inspiring us, especially the youth. And I hope one day when the pandemic is over, I can meet you in person. Have a nice day.